So this is week three of our uh, fall speaker series. We do it twice a year in the springtime and the fall. This spring, um, normally we do it on campus and invite speakers to come and stay and have dinner with us and speak to people in person. But with the world as it is, um, we switched it to be online. And I actually think it's great because um, we're able to have you know, speakers such as yourself who are coming, would be coming from much farther away. And I know that you're very busy, Shelly, and probably wouldn't be able to make a trip up for an evening talk. Um, so I'm very grateful that we can expand the reach of um, who we feature in this program, uh, as well as have more people coming and attending um, across the country. We've even had folks that have asked about recordings that are in Egypt and in Germany, and um, it feels like a really special way to um, reach more of the Estramar community that does span much farther than this little valley that we're in in Vermont. Um, to highlight organizations and people that are doing work in the world that's redesign build, as I've been calling it. Like, you know, this country was founded on a lot of really horrible things that, um, yeah, it's founded on, on a lot of racist structures and slavery and those systems persist in a lot of ways that um, we don't necessarily see as directly related. Um, and that it's important to change those structures and systems um, in order to allow for real uh, healing and growth to come. And I feel that uh, Shelley and the folks at Black Women Build Baltimore are doing that in such an incredible way of um, addressing some of the systemic issues that have created the conditions that are, a lot of people are living within and trying to um, find ways through and beyond. But without having those systemic changes, like it's not gonna happen as easily. So um, I'm very excited that you're um, going to share your work with us, Shelley, and I can't wait to hear what you have planned for us. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Rachel, so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm basically going to talk about um, building community wealth and knowledge together. Um, and in talking about that, um, I'm, I'm going to share some statistics um, about uh, some of the ways that uh, Baltimore came to be. Um, and that's going to be talking about redlining, um, which is um, a practice uh, that began wholeheartedly in the 40s. And um, it, it has helped create uh, some of the wealth disparities that we see today. Um, it changed the landscape um, of this of um, many cities in the United States, Baltimore included. Um, and by the time the Fair Housing Act rolled around in 1968, um, and then like even like a couple decades after that, like really um, for it to have some teeth, um, the, 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 the wealth gap um, again grew exponentially. Right, so that all the all the growth that black families could have had had they been able to buy in certain areas, um, they just got left behind, and then it would be unaffordable for them with the market with the growth um, for them to catch up. So there's some statistics. If you guys like statistics, um, you're going to get some in the beginning. So um, come with me. So. This statistic, um, it just talks about the average black household having the same or the it's like one tenth of the wealth. You can see it, um, which is pretty incredible. Right. So intergenerational transfers like financing um, college education, um, down payment on houses, uh, gift gifts to seed. Uh, uh, asset accumulation, that sort of stuff, um, which you would see in a, in a lot of the white population, um, black folks were unable to do that. Um, and so when thinking about wealth uh, versus income, um, they're, they're not the same thing. So income is mainly is used like for daily necessities and where, and that's like sort of like what you're able to pay out of your pocket. And, you know, you put a little aside and, and you pay for daily things, yearly things, um, groceries, 
rent, whatever you, you, you understand what I'm saying, but wealth, it really, it, it's, it's about the resources, um, that about growth over time. Right. And so black folks have been left out of that, that growth over time, um, that X factor. And part of that, um, is through housing, which is what I work on. And so I'm just trying to figure out how to change that narrative for where I live and with the people I work with. Um, let's see. So, like I said, I'm trying to figure this out. So um, I developed this program and this model and it's called Black Women Build Baltimore. And some of the things that I see in Baltimore, um, other than blight, is I see potential, right? I saw potential in the buildings, I saw potential in the people, and trying to figure out a way to, to rebuild these houses where uh, other people just saw rundown houses as, you know, as a carpenter, um, I really felt that those could be rebuilt, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and you guys, you're gonna look at the stats. I'm not gonna read them. You could, you know, we can all do that together. Um, so I talked about redlining and um, this is, now I am gonna read this one. See, I already fibbed. Um, the, the systematic denial of loans to people of color, a practice that emerged during the Great Depression as part of the New Deal. So basically what happened, the long and short of it, is there um, was a private corporation that was backed by the federal government um, for, for mortgages, right? And so those people were able to dictate who they would, who would, they, who they would give loans to, right? So they, they, working with the Federal Housing Authority, they would uh, do longer loans, right? So you get that 30-year loan, um, loans to first-time homeowners, um, lower down payments because they're backed by the feds, right? But what the homeowners loan corporation did is they, they basically drew lines um, in a, or around black neighborhoods and it was with a red marker, red pen, and they were like, we're not gonna loan to these people, right? So we're, you know, you are basically left out of um, the opportunity to uh, get these loans, right, that would secure a mortgage. So they also did some, you know, it's like, well, these are green, these are red, these are yellow, these are blue. So there are all these, you know, basically they went cran happy and uh, I don't know, and just marked up maps that showed where, where people could buy houses and where they could get loans for houses. So this is the map of Baltimore and Baltimore is pretty much ground zero for redlining. Like they, they loved it here. They exported it, man. It like all over the States. And so you see this red area, right? Which is considered inner city. It, um, and that is where predominantly black folks live in Baltimore. I mean, Baltimore at this point is like, at this point, like this day and time is around 68% uh, African-American. Um, before then it was even higher. It's just like, um, it is a black city, um, which is just, I don't know, it makes me smile. Um, so you see that, you see that small area. And so that's like just this densely populated area where, um, where black people had to live. Like you could not live outside of that because one um, could be dangerous because white folks don't want to live with you or two, uh, you just couldn't get a loan, right? You just could not get a loan to live in any other area of town. So there is, um, I happen to live in a redlined area. Um, it's about six blocks from where I work and um, four blocks from that, you there is, it, this is another neighborhood, right? It's called Bolton Hill. And four blocks away from me um, is where that redlining pretty much, at least in this area, began. And you see the effects of it, right? So these stately homes, right? Oh, you see a little lovely lane there. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a really nice neighborhood. Um, Well-kept city services, um, schools, 
schools. Um, people care a lot about schools. Um, so, so that's the difference, right? So here you go, Baltimore, two thirds population is, is, is African-American, but the unemployment rate in Baltimore, it's three times higher, right? Than, than for white people. Uh, what else does it say? Two thirds people do not possess three months worth of savings to cover expenses in the event of a job loss. We actually learned during at the beginning of COVID or actually before that, that most people couldn't afford a $400 um, incident in their lives. So um, if if most people can't do it, honestly, it's, it's gonna be even more difficult for people of color. Um, and so this is where I come in. Um, I came to Baltimore and there were 16,000 vacant houses. So mind you, this block is four or five blocks from where Bolton Hill is. Okay. So just, so, so that's, that's part of the difference, right? Like in four blocks that you see these boarded up houses, um, just left in disrepair. Um, it's really, it's really a trip for me, someone coming um, from somewhere else. I lived in Seattle for years. Very, very different landscape. Um, not that there wasn't redlining in Seattle, uh, not that uh, black and brown neighborhoods didn't get um, as good as services in Seattle compared to white neighborhoods. But Baltimore, it's really in stark relief. It's just something. Um, um, well, I don't know. I, I would just say it needs to be combated, basically. I'm. That's about all I'm going to say about that. Um, so understanding that, right, that there's all these houses and as a carpenter, of course, of course I just see potential. Um, oops, somebody wants to tell me things. Um, you know, so part of it is that black women, um, we, we lag behind others, um, any other group, right? Um, black, white, brown, anything, right? And gender, black women, uh, as a group, we own less property. Uh, we have less ability to pass on wealth. Um, and uh, the, uh, the Insight Center for Community and Economic Development, like 10 years ago, they, um, they did a study and they found that black women's median wealth ranged between zero and a hundred dollars. Right. And then also if black women um, have children, they have actually negative wealth. Right. They just they can't they have less money than if they didn't have children. Well, I mean, you do the math. Um, so. So also there's a there's a difficulty um, with the gap on home ownership. And it does uh, it does stem from housing segregation. Uh, this slide says it says the 60s, and that's what we're talking about. I mean, it's 40s, 60s, 80s. I mean, it's it continues to happen, right? So if we're able to get people into houses, right, um, instead of mowing down houses, um, there's a possibility for us to be able to, to, to nar the word's narrow, narrow that, that wealth gap. Right. Um, let me see if my slide will go. I don't know why it won't. Hmm. Well, my computer's frozen. I see I something care. happening on your screen. And I don't know why. That's Monty Python. <laughs> anyway. so, um, Try clicking one more time. Uh, wow. Let's see. Hmm. I told Rachel earlier that I could build her a house, but I really <laughs> am going to struggle with a PowerPoint. And, <laughs> and now you see it. I think you're doing great. Hmm. <laughs> um, Appreciate it. <laughs> I know you guys are like, enough with the stats. Let's see the houses. Um, <laughs> I'm getting there. I was getting there. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, there you go. There's like a nice awesome. fade. <laughs> um, that is, well, uh, 
anyway, I mean, here again, more information. Now it's doing this. Oh, that's so interesting. It's like doing this fade thing. Um, basically, this is what I was talking about. It's just more and more graphs of um, the disparity and how it really was institutionalized. So now we're getting to the part that I, um, I, that just really hurts me um, as someone who is um, a builder and likes to think that um, we can fix things. Um, I don't know, by addressing them, right? So um, the area that I'm working in, um, it, it has suffered really disproportionately from low housing values, um, high rates of vacancy and abandonment. So a lot of people are like, Baltimore's it. I'm going to buy a place in Baltimore and I'm going to hold it, right? And so basically what they do is they just degrade the housing market by, by it's called buy and hold, you know, great buy and hold. And then they hold it so long that there's no more windows in it <laughs> and that the roof is starting to cave in on itself, right? And so the, what has happened is that uh, the, um, I don't want to say the panacea, but, 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 but the answer that the city and the state has come up with is to demolish um, thousands of houses. Um, and it's difficult because, because it costs more to rehab these houses than it does to, to, um, to renovate them or rehabilitate them. Um, but it's, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, anyway, yeah, so there's, there's that. So here we are, Baltimore, overlook, underfunded, devalued, right? So, so the project of the Edding Street project, which is what Black Women Build Baltimore is working on, it's our first project. Um, I foresee that there will be um, several more um, sort of uh, tributaries, tentacles, I don't know, out from Edding Street. Uh, there are several quite a few properties that are deemed vacant by the city, whether they're city owned or privately owned. They, a lot of them look like, like those houses. Um, so we're trying to eliminate blight by creating quality houses, right? Instead of making more empty lots, um, a lot of people like to call it green space, uh, but I always say green space is stewarded and these lots are not stewarded, they are little garbage catchers, as far as I can tell. Um, so right now we're working in, um, in an area of town called Druid Heights, um, which abuts an area of town called Upton. Um, so we are uh, working in these two um, uh, historical neighborhoods, uh, historical because they're black neighborhoods, historical because they're part of Old West Baltimore and you get those those beautiful, beautiful row homes with cornices and brick facade and the marble steps. And it's just, I mean, I, it's, it's beautiful, quite, quite honestly, I, I find it really beautiful. Um, so what I'm trying to do is, is pair kind of on the job training, uh, you know, so the skills that you would need to rehab a home um, with uh, an opportunity for home ownership. Right, so I work along side by side with the women who are um, who are going to own the home, and um, you know there is, you know, we talk about finances, talk about try to eat a little bit better. We talk about um, communication skills. Um, I'm pretty blunt, so pretty much if it's in my head, it's out my mouth. Um, not everybody works like that, and so. Um, you know, trying to be better listeners, um, that sort of stuff. So that's kind of what we're working on at the moment. Um, so you can see here that, you know, you can see that the makeup of the area of town that I'm working in. Um, and um, I don't know, it's, it's home now, very different from Seattle, I can tell you that. Um, and I really appreciate it. I appreciate it a lot. Um, it is, I always thought about Baltimore, I had sort of romanticized it, it as like this um, hard scrabble, uh, blue collar uh, town. 
and um, it has not disappointed in that way. Um, so more stats, you know, um, which is just kind of intense. Um, so you can see um, in the area that we're working in, um, uh, not only are the houses challenged, but um, the people in order to live their daily lives, it is challenging. Um, there is just a complete lack of um, employment for most people um, in this area or any viable employment. Um, so that's difficult. Um, and it's, you know, it's difficult to get by, right? But it's also difficult just like, you know, if you want to buy a house, like the rent in, in Baltimore is just exponential compared to um, how much the houses cost, right? Like you can, you can get a house for $50,000, right? Um, and your mortgage would be so low and people are paying 700 bucks a month for rent or a thousand bucks a month for rent for a house that somebody picked up for maybe 15,000. And then they didn't really do much work to it, right? So um, Baltimore is a place where I met my first slumlord. Um, maybe I haven't lived a lot of places, but um, that was a trip to me. Somebody, I, when I met him, I just said, you take money from people for this? He didn't know what to say, because what are you going to say? Um, except that he didn't take money. So, um, so like I said, uh, 10 years ago, uh, the, the Center for um, Community and Economic Development, they were like women's wealth uh, range between zero and a hundred bucks. So now there's a newer study. It was newer in 2017. And it still said that black women fall behind everybody else, right? In wealth accumulation. So again, that's why I started Black Women Build. So here we are. Um, I, as a black woman, um, you know, I focus on, on, on helping black women thrive. Um, I want to see us thrive. People say, oh, well, why not on this population? And I'm like, start your own program. So um, I don't know, or join ours and help us build, right? So we matter. Um, black women matter. Um, you know, it's the, the slide says, why does black women build Baltimore matter? Um, we matter because black women matter, right? So owning one's own home, um, we all know that that's, you know, you, you need a foot in the door, right? You need to build that equity um, that at some point after you build that equity, you may be able to use that for, um, I don't know, to help finance an education, to help uh, start a business. I don't know, maybe you end up getting an equity line and buying another house because uh, now you've worked on your house for a while and you're able to buy something and start to start to build in that way. Um, it basically home ownership, as we know, is, is potential for wealth. And again, I'm not talking millions and millions of dollars. I'm talking about, um, about a sense of security, right? So this is, um, this was our, this was our first house. Um, this is Quan Shea, and she was our first participant. Um, so what I believe is that training women in trades related work, um, we provide a tangible set of skills um, that can be used on other jobs. It can be used in the home. It can be used to help your neighbors. Um, trades work two to three times what you would make, like, to, like compared to like female centered jobs. So like if you're a certified nurse's assistant or maybe, um, you know, a pharmacy tech, or there's all these training programs in Baltimore and very few of them um, trades related, do they uh, um, try to get women in there or black women? So for me, again, um, I was a carpenter in the union um, for 13 years and I've been a carpenter by trade 25 years. And it has allowed me to do a lot of things in my life that I would not have been able to do otherwise. So ideally, we, sub we provide a safe and supportive environment uh, for the women to learn these trades. Um, so in some ways, I don't call it an apprenticeship, but, but it's approached as an apprenticeship. Um, we're working, you know, I as a journey person next to my apprentice and we work together to teach the skills. So this is, um, this is the Edding Street project. Um, and it is a multi-house, multi-phase housing rehabilitation project. 
Um, and we focus on one block at a time, right? We work toward whole block outcomes um, because basically in Baltimore, you need to build in clusters because um, you see uh, how in some areas, how desolate it can be. So in order to do like one house in a row of, of vacant houses, um, one, it doesn't secure your house. Like you need to have houses around you also have a roof. And that might sound odd, but if you've come to Baltimore, you will see that, um, well, you see this, this is one of our houses. This is, I think, 1905, right? The, the slide, at least I'm looking at it, it's on the right. Um, so that's the kind of house that we got um, to work on. We, we finished one house um, and, then, and then I got these. Um, so these are two-story contiguous houses. They're row homes, they're approximately I don't know, eight, 900 square feet. And they have two bedroom, one bath. And, you know, pretty easy. I saw these and thought these, these are doable, right? Like they look like this, but you gut them, you stabilize them, frame them out basically. And, and these are doable. These are viable houses, right? So this is us. Um, this is, this is the group of women I'm working with right now. Um, come from all over, di different walks of life, right? But all live in Baltimore, all black women, all earning, uh, they're all wage earners. Nobody's like salaried and, and, and you know, have all the, all the little boxes checked, right? So trying to get that, that income where it would be really difficult to buy a house, um, to save those extra few dollars a month to get a down payment. Um, so, so trying to work with that population, right. And, and get that leg up. So that's the, that's the point of this. Um, so this is a row of houses, uh, actually right around the corner, uh, that were demolished, tried to save those that didn't happen. Um, but I just, I mean, look at those. Those are just beautiful. Like just the, I don't know, the unit, the uniformity of it. I, I appreciate that. Um, so, so trying to work with these women where it's like, you know, we say um, uh, building community knowledge and wealth together. And, and the first thing is community because in these in these neighborhoods, in these where where you have blocks and blocks or houses and houses that are empty or vacant, it's really important to build that community, to build in clusters. Um, one, like I was starting to say, it, it protects the house, but it also, um, to build a sense of community and to have a sense of pride in that, uh, you own the house, you know your neighbors, you know, you've all sort of worked through the same thing. Um, you have each other's back, right? Um, you you have investment, right? You want to see this thing succeed. You want your property values to go up. You know, you want the city to pick up your garbage. And if you're a homeowner and you have a cluster of homeowners that, and then, and you say, we all want our garbage picked up, um, that might happen. Um, I'm not saying that garbage doesn't get picked up in Baltimore, but there's a lot of dumping in Baltimore. And if, you know, basically we are stronger together, right? So, um, and your voices are heard. And, you know, if you're, if we're talking um, and we're talking in, in, in unison um, about our, our needs, um, people are more apt to listen. Um, so this slide is actually, um, this is the first house. Uh, this is Quan Che's house. And we, we basically gutted it. It still had a roof, even though we had to put a new roof on it. Um, but out of the other houses we're working on, it's the only one that had a roof. Um, but it had been in disrepair for many, many years. Um, and so this is, this is us just really giving it a go. It was basically just her and I um, banging this out together. Um, it took, took several months um, to get this done. But, but we did it. Um, this house, it was basically uh, framing, you know, you have your HVAC, your plumbing rough-ins, um, your electrical um, 
sheetrock. I mean, basically, Quan Chi and I gutted it and then uh, did the framing staircase. Um, just, just put it back together. Um, and for me, this was a very, um, this was like I needed to do one in order to understand a little bit how houses come together in Baltimore. Um, after living in Seattle for many years, um, I had worked on a lot of wood frame structures. Um, and I'd done a lot of finish work in, in the union. I had done um, my fair amount of concrete, but like brick, um, for me, I don't know, it was just different, right? And the row home is different. And, um, you know, it's just building, it really is. But, um, but I just hadn't, I actually hadn't worked on anything in such disrepair before. And it felt a little daunting. So it was great to work on something that didn't have um, its roof down into the basement, like for our first house. Um, and so here we are, um, again, just beautiful row homes. I know that there's not a roof and you can see through, you know, to the sky, um, but it's just, just stunning. Like I see, you know, all the cornices, um, you know, uh, uh, restored, you know, all the brick facades repointed, you know, wooden windows with the Baltimore, Baltimore bull, bull nose. So that's what I see when I see this. Um, and, you know, what we got um, was this back. So this is a back section of one of the houses we're working on. There's a tree growing out of it, um, which I think in a later slide, you can see the tree. That back section had completely failed. Um, and we have kept the tree. It's kind of a cool tree, so we kept it. But um, you know, I just, you look at that and you think how many years of um, neglect, right? Um, did that take for that tree to grow? I mean, I will give it, right? It's a fast growing tree, but man, I mean, I, I wish I had put the picture in. There are bricks that the tree has grown around. Like just, it's incredible, just like this, right? And, and that takes some time, right? That's just like, disinvestment. It's just, it's just incredible. Um, but again, so much potential. Um, so here's the same house. The back section has been taken down. Um, there sh there's no roof on it at this point. Um, there's shoring on the side because it's an end of group. Um, so those are some two by 12s trying to hold it together while the, um, while, uh, the joists are being put in. So when you stabilize a house, um, you're going to put uh, new floor joists and roof joists and then new subfloor. And ideally, if you can, you would pocket those joists back into the old pockets uh, that held the original joists. And then you would pack that with like a mortar. Um, sometimes you can just do framing on the interior and, and then put your joists on top of that right um with a sill plate and then and then you you build your joists like that i mean you build your floor uh like that and then and then you would put stars in into the side now this is on an end of group right because if it's a if it's an interior row house or a middle row house then um ideally um those those sides have stayed pretty much like this there's not bowing like this is what you see here, this has a nice bulge in the middle. You probably can't see it from here, but um, yeah, it's pretty out. So, so we took stars, um, there, you'll see a lot of stars in Baltimore and they're literally like these metal steel stars and with a hole in it. And then you take a piece of um, all thread, um, a rod and you drill through into, uh, through the brick, through the framing members um, you can go about, I don't know, three, four feet in, and then that, uh, you, and then you nut it on the outside, right? You put a, you put a, a, um, a nut on that bolt and then the star, it's only going to hold maybe, what do they say? Like an eight brick, like only about that much of it, but you put enough in and it keeps that brick from moving anymore. Um, and then you can set those in mortar too, um, to help, I don't know, to help it adhere to the side, to the stucco. Um, and then inside, 
you've gone through several, you've gone through several um, joists, right? You've drilled a hole through the joist and then you nut that on each, on each joist. Or if it's a side view like this one, your joists are actually running, um, they're running perpendicular to the wall. And so you would actually put blocking in, in between the floor joists and then drill through that. That's kind of technical. I don't know if anybody's really interested in that, but that's how we do it. Um, which, you know, you drive around Baltimore and you see these stars and you're like, oh, that's so cool. Um, but really um, it's just trying to hold that building together. So um, these are just more pictures of, um, so that's the tree from the, from that back section what, that was um, demolished. Um, and we are not building around it again. We're gonna keep it because it looks kind of like Gumby. Um, so these are some more slides of just the, the interior of Quan Che's house. And again, um, you know, the idea is to work alongside with the women and teach them um, the tools, not to be scared of the tools, you know, of the chop saw and the table saw and the nail gun and, and that sort of stuff. Um, we, wire the, we wire the houses. They understand, you know, where the wires go, right? How they, how they go back to the panel and then, you know, how to wire an outlet, how to wire the switches to the lights, how to wire a three-way switch. Um, so it's sort of like understanding the guts. I think it's super important that that's, that, you know, the house doesn't begin from the sheetrock in, you know? So we're doing sort of the, um, I think that they would think it's really unfun right now because it's really, um, it's a lot of labor. It's very labor intensive. Um, so, but we do it, right? So like you'll see on these other slides, we did some brick infill and we're doing insulation. And so the difference, right? Um, when we build these houses, the houses that are these size, right? These are some of the smaller row houses. These are great first time um, houses for us to do, um, to get to sort of streamline the process a little bit. So the city was going to demolish um, a lot of the block, right? And so um, we came in and said, you know, we'll take these, we will, we will stabilize these and don't demolish them. And what I found out is it's about $30,000 to demolish a house. And um, as luck would have it, it's about $30,000 to stabilize. So of course I was like, hey, don't, don't knock them down, give us the money and we'll stabilize them. Um, that didn't work in their equation, but, um, but that is the difference, right? So once we're done with the stabilization, it's about $80,000, right? To, to, to rehab these houses. And that's what we sell them for. We sell them pretty much at cost. Um, I mean, we lose a little money, um, but also we're building um, a homeowner. We're, bu we're building a community, right? And so it makes it really, really affordable um, with the first time home buyers, um, um, grants or programs. Um, these are vacant houses. So there's something with the city, at least this year, again, there's a vacance to value and they, um, they're able to get $10,000 toward their um, down payment and closing costs. So, um, all of a sudden your house that's 80,000 is more like 70 or 60,000, depending on the, um, the first time home buyer, uh, programs. So now you have a mortgage on a house, uh, that's maybe around 650, $700 for a 15 year mortgage on a brand new house, right? That's affordable. That is affordable. That is something that someone can pay that they can think about, Hey, do I want to go back to school? Or do I want to learn something new? Or do I want to keep the job that I'm doing and then actually have a life outside and explore other things because I'm not house poor? So that's super important um, I, for the women and for me to make it something that's affordable. Um, and this is the way I've, I've, I've figured out to do it. So um, these next pictures are just actually, this is our new cohort. Um, they're putting in the recessed lighting 
in the house, um, in the houses. We're working on three right now. Um, so we, we basically have the houses stabilized. Um, and then they'll also do uh, the interior framing. And then we, and then the rough in happens. So the, the subs come in, HVAC, plumbing. And then we actually do the electrical. We set the boxes, we do the recess lighting, we wire it. Um, and that's kind of awesome. It's not something everybody loves doing, um, but it's part of it, right? So here we're, um, there's like some block that's being set, the infill, uh, you have to infill like with like. And so we have um, taken block instead of brick. So anywhere there's a chimney uh, that's taken out, we have to infill it. Um, it's code for, the, for fire um, protection. Um, and so we did, a, we did a good week and a half of infill. Um, everybody hated it, so I must have been doing something right. Um, here's me looking at a tape measure trying to explain something. I don't know. Again, um, yeah, so there you are. And then here is more, these are the concrete blocks. Um, you know, it's just honestly, it's the sense of pride that these women have in the work that they're doing is, um, it's pretty awesome. And, and, you know, I can go over all over Seattle and say, I built that, I built that, I built that First Avenue South drawbridge not by myself, but together, right? And that's what they're gonna be able to do. I built this thing. I, you know, I, I did that. Um, we provide a stipend as well uh, for their work. Um, I always like to say we value their time and their commitment, that it's not just sweat equity. Um, I, I get a little exhausted about, you know, oh, sweat equity, you know, as if that's the only thing we have to give is, is our sweat. We got a lot more to give. Um, and so we're going to make it um, as, mm, I don't know, as thoughtful as we can in order to um, support these women in this endeavor. Um, so here are some um, before and afters. Um, this is Quan Che's house. Um, you know, this is the front. I think these aren't like all completely done. I mean, meaning these aren't it's the after, but it's like not painted or whatever, or, you know, there's still a board on the window because probably we weren't quite done and we didn't want anyone to break in or break the window. Um, you know, this is the before and after of, you know, the, the, the second floor, it looks out over, over the street. Um, you know, we put in um, engineered hardwood floors. Um, the doors are like six panel, uh, solid wood, um, hollow core offends me. Um, recess lighting, um, you know, uh, the oak stairs and, you know, that was really nice um, to do. I don't know. So, I mean, this is basically, you know, this is it, like, this is what, what we did, and this is what we are doing, and it will change the trajectory of um, of their lives, and also I I do believe of the neighborhood because there's a lot to do, and we can do it. I mean, honestly, we just need houses, and and I was gonna say a couple bucks because that's how I talk, but we need just like you know tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so anyway, here are the references, and. I don't know. That's that's kind of it. I hope this was helpful. <laughs> that was uh, that was awesome, Shelley. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, everyone who has been watching, if you have questions, type them into the Q and A box. We already have a couple. Um, so, Shelley, there was a question about how you get access to develop the homes. I feel like you touched on it just a little bit, um, but they were kind of curious about the permitting and purchasing process. Um, so the houses so far that we've gotten, um, they're all city owned um, and there's an application process. Um, I, I had tried to get these houses, uh, the whole block saved, but they knocked down some of them. And so um, I, for these first four houses, um, it was sort of like, let's see let's see if she does what she says she's going to do. Um, Baltimore is plagued by people promising things and then just absconding with the money. So 
so that's basically it. What I do, I look around. I mean, I just, I, I just happen to see, I live, I live close to here, right? So I just, or you could roll down almost a lot of these neighborhoods and there are houses, houses, houses. So um, privately owned houses, make an offer on it. Um, a lot of houses are at auction. You could buy at auction. There's several um, auction houses in Baltimore. And then these houses, again, are vacants to value. Mm -hmm. And they have a list of properties, um, a suggested uh, price for them. We got these four houses for $5,000. Wow. Um, the one with the roof, Quan Chase house, was two grand. Um, and we overpaid. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this thing. Um, we have another question and comment from Erin, who was one of our instructors at Yes Tomorrow. She said, Shelly, thank you for your righteous work. I want to know a bit more about how the funding works for purchase, rebuild, and work training. Who holds the mortgage and is the homeowner always part of the build? So, yeah. So, homeowner is always part of the build. Um, that's that's part of it. I, I, I'm... As someone who's a tradesperson, I, I think it's really valuable to understand your house and to be able to to be able to work on it, right? Um, a lot of people could afford materials, but they can't afford the labor. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if you're able to work on it or know someone, um, or call me, um, you know, then then you know you're more apt to keep your house up, right? It doesn't fall into disrepair. Um, the nonprofit holds the houses, right? So, Black Women Build Baltimore Inc. Um, is um, the owner, the buyer and the owner. Um, we sell it. They, the participants need to get a mortgage, right? So you need to be able to, um, you need to have a fairly decent credit score. Um, you need to have, um, I think it's like 24, like 3% of um, a down payment saved. Even if your down payment is gifted, we still want to see that you're that you're able to 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 come up with it, right? Um, we, you know, part of this is really um, uh, financial liter literacy and fiscal um, responsibility or, or acuity. Um, and what was it? I can't remember the other part. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm pulling it up again. Um, yeah, if the homeowner is always part of the build and who. Yeah, so there. Who holds the mortgage. There is, yeah, so there is some, um, there are some restrictions on alienation or basically you can't sell this um, or encumber it. So not take a second on it um, for five years. That's one of our restrictions, but it's also part of the vacants to value. If you want that 10 grand, they have a forgivable loan. Um, and what we do is basically um, we've dumped a lot more money into it than what you've paid. And so um, basically anything, if you sell it before the five years, um, anything over that $80,000 goes back to Black Women Bill Baltimore in order to do more work. Um, so they, you know, when the house is sold to them, that money comes back into our coffers in order to do more work. So it's, it really behooves us to, um, to find a participant that, that is able to complete the process. And that means also being able to buy the house. Um, you know, you work, we work during the week, we work Monday through Thursday, nine to five. Um, they're still working jobs. Some on the weekend, uh, one person leaves at three and works from like four to nine every night, um, which is also why we, you know, we, we pay a stipend, um, which helps with um, just their living expenses or if they have all their debt paid, they can save it or they can pay off debt. But it's, um, yeah, it's not for everyone. Somebody said, well, how am I supposed to do this if I work during the day? And I said, well, it's not, it's not for everybody. You know, um, those are some of the challenges. Those are some of the decisions that a person would have to make um, if they want to do this. You know, you just have to weigh what, what, what is important. And I'm not saying that, that if they choose something else, that this is less important, but it just might not work for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
Um, we have a couple other questions that have come in. Um, Melanie is wondering if you have other uh, partners that are working with you to provide funding and other support. Uh, I've written some grants, but it's been, not, I mean, not yet. Hey, yeah. what's your number? So, I mean, no, we, um, are you interested? So we, I, I don't know, I, I write grants. Um, so the state, city and state have um, uh, been pretty uh, good supporters for us for capital. Um, our operating is not as um, robust as um, I would like to see it, but, but capital, um, because we're able to, to uh, reinvigorate our coffers with that, with the sale, um, you know, we're looking at when, when we're done this year, you know, ideally everybody buys the house and that's just going back into, into, into the work that we do. Um, but we don't have partners, um, we don't have financial partners. Um, I honestly, you know, um, the banks in terms of like the mortgages, um, I am not, I'm someone who's just like, who's going to help our participants, right? Do you have a loan program where they're going to get more money? Do you have a loan program where um, it pays all their closing costs so that they can use all the money for down payment, right? So I'm not, I'm not beholden to anybody who isn't going to, uh, be the best for our participants. Mm -hmm. Awesome. But you're always open to financial partners, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess, honestly, it's really interesting. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of like, how do you scale this, right? How do you scale this? How do we get in on this? And um, the reason it works for us is because I, for the most part, I've done everything. So I am CEO to janitor. I'm the general contractor. I have my MHIC, my general contracting license here in Baltimore. Um, I'm the executive director. So I do, right now I do the grant writing. I do the liaising. I do the admin. I do like, you know what I mean? So it's like somebody wants to start this somewhere else. It would be difficult because you have to have that one person in the beginning mm -hmm. or you don't take a salary, right? Yeah. And then you get it started and hope that, that um, you know, that some of that Reaganomics, that trickle down stuff that is actually is really true and, um, and, it, and it ends up in your pocket. So cool. Yeah. We're um, getting close to eight o'clock, but we still have some more questions. So I'll see how many I can get through. Um, one of them from Taylor is, uh, are there any local building codes in particular that make it harder to do what you're doing? Um, hmm. No, but I mean, so, so this is a, this is an historic area, right? So the grants I wrote were, um, uh, uh, were successful from, um, Maryland State Department of Housing and Community Development and Baltimore City Department of Housing and Community Development. So in, in Maryland State, they have a thing called MHT. It's the Maryland Historical Trust. Mm -hmm. And in Baltimore, you have CHAP, which is like something historical architecture and preservation. I don't know what, it, what the C is, but it may be committee. So, so those guys, because these are grants <laughs> that we're receiving, you, um, we have to go in and take pictures. And if the historical trust says, hmm, yeah, there's enough trim left there, then we might have to recreate the trim, right? Uh, they also have um, tax credits uh, if we do that kind of work. So these, the first house, we didn't do it. We didn't have enough money. Um, but these three houses, we are applying for CHAP. And what, what that does basically is um, on the facades, they need to be repointed. You have to use um, a mortar that is something that they say, yes, that seems, you know, period mortar, right? And then uh, wooden windows with a Baltimore bull nose, wooden front door, um, you know, those windows, I mean, they're like, a, you know, 600 bucks each, the door 1200 bucks. So it's a lot more expensive than let's say a, just a, 
I don't know, a Home Depot metal six panel door, right? But when you do that um, and they accept that you have jumped through the hoops that they want you to, um, there's a 10 year tax credit that the buyer gets. So why this is also affordable is because you buy it for 80,000, the tax base was, you know, when we bought it, maybe 3,000 or $6,000. So your taxes are 120 bucks, let's say. So now it's appraised at 80,000 and now your taxes are 1800, right? A year, right? That's a lot that, you know, it's 150 bucks a month. So, so they do an incremental uh, tax increase um, over those 10 years and they use the base of 6,000, mm -hmm. right? So even if this area becomes gentrified, which, you know, who knows, right? But even if it does, um, people that are coming in and flipping houses, they're not doing that. They're not doing those historical uh, preservation things. So they're not, so those, that tax base will be paying $1,800 a year for their taxes. Um, so that's the only thing in terms of, and that's not even a code. Um, that's just something that with the grants, I have to be aware of um, and do sort of like the before pictures. And they say, yeah, you gotta, you gotta recreate this. But you know, for us, because the interiors are completely destroyed, there's nothing to recreate. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much carte blanche on the interior, but the exterior is um, something. But no, not really. I mean, we have an architect and structural engineer that works with us and it's just, just follow the plans. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> All right, let me uh, look at these last couple questions um, and see there's, uh, well, one first question. Um, is around how you found women to participate in the program so far. Um, and yeah, how did they apply? How did, do you find them yourselves? How does that work? Yeah, so yeah. we, um, on our website, we have um, a fairly short application um, for the candidates. And um, once they apply, we then, uh, you know, we reach out and talk to them and see um, you know, their thoughts on community, uh, where they are financially, um, you know, just why are they interested in this? Because I've said, I, I'm more interested in building community um, because that's going to help build the wealth than it is just, I'm not flipping houses. That's not what I'm, I've ever been interested in. That's not what I do. Um, we want to create stability. Um, so it's actually been difficult uh, it's been difficult finding the participants, quite honestly. There's, um, you know, I would honestly, I would say, please just answer the, all the questions, you know, because um, that's, that, that's very helpful in order to be able to know where, where a person is coming from. So mm -hmm. since COVID, it's been a little difficult. I had hoped to go around to some of these training programs that were for, um, that did like, certified nurses assistant and pharmacy tech and like some of these other ones and say, hey, do you want to do another training program and then basically own your home um, on the salary that you're earning? Um, I'm better in person. I don't know. Maybe I'm not. But I just feel like I could, you know, I could sort of sell the program in person. And so maybe I can on Zoom. I don't know. I mean, I think you're doing a, great. <laughs> okay, right on. So man, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe I should do like a Friday afternoon Zoom. And so let people ask questions. I don't know. Anyway, um, it's difficult, though. We've had we've had difficulty finding, finding folks and follow through. Yeah. So interesting. Because yeah, it does seem that um, like what you're cultivating, creating, offering is powerful. It's something that a lot of people would jump for, but there's also, you know, it's more than just a house as, you know, you've said mm -hmm. before, it's, it is, um, and that, that requires like that personal drive and investment in it and that's, that's, belief yeah. in themselves too, that they can make that shift in their life. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because it, yeah. it really isn't about the house. It's, yeah. It's just so much bigger than that, you know? I really believe that. And um, the house is like the vehicle, right? Um, and we are building wealth. I really believe in that in, in the way that I know how, 
but I really want to grow a sense of community. And, and this is the way I know how to do it. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> All right, let's see, a uh, couple more questions. Um, so what what about um, after? What do, what do your participants end up doing after? Do they help with other builds that you do? Do they go on and kind of just live their lives or do they stay um, involved with Black Women Build in some capacity? No. Um yeah, ideally they stay involved. So um, Quan Shea, uh, we have been doing this. Um, well, actually we just began it. It's called Chat and Chew and Ooh, she lives down the block. Fun. And so <laughs> she comes and we, you know, we just watched um, this documentary, uh, Holding Ground. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about this uh, um, community in Boston. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't remember the name of the community, but they basically just said, we're not a dumping ground and we want through eminent domain, we want the city to give us our community the land in order to build the things that we want to see. Cool. Um, and it's just super cool. So we, you know, we watched that, right? And we talked about what is, you know, what was inspiring about that, right? Um, you know, reading, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I can't push like, you know, f f I don't know, black feminist literature on everybody, but you know, I can, but I can definitely, um, we definitely try to have those conversations, right? So Quan Chi comes over, we have those conversations. Um, you know, some people want to be engaged. Some, you know, one person's a gardener, right? And we're getting some land um, and that uh, at the end of the block where they, you know, made empty lots, we're now actually going to grow food on it, right? So there are opportunities for participants to continue participating um, in the community beyond um, beyond the four to five months it takes to build the houses. That's, yeah. So there's opportunity. Um, not everybody, I don't want to say this out loud, but I'm gonna, because like I said, it's brain to mouth. Um, not everybody's a builder, right? Like, you know, you don't, I mean, not everybody, that's not going to be the thing that they offer. Um, yeah. But that's what we're trying to figure out is what everybody has to give. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. And also, you know, still making sure that they have the understanding of how their house became what it is and how to make repairs yeah. and, and navigate that. It makes such a big difference. Um, yep. That's awesome. Um, Okay, let's see. Um, another question from some of our current semester students at Yes Tomorrow. Um, they asked if you need to be a woman of color, or black woman to join and help with your organization. How do you, um, I guess COVID makes it a little bit weird with having volunteer support, but how do you navigate that? <laughs> It does. So volunteering is a little difficult. Um, at first, I was super excited about having volunteers. And then um, it's difficult because I'm teaching three, mm -hmm. sometimes four people. We have an intern now. And so, you know, and it's like, it's a lot, right? And so a volunteer who is there who wants to just learn, um, actually, it takes um, time away from the participants yeah. who are who are wanting to learn. Mm -hmm. um, so volunteers who don't, I don't know, if, you know, I don't want. You say want some skilled volunteer doing, support. Need, <laughs> also need some guidance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, I've got you. You know, I'm, um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I, <laughs> sorry, I'm like cut that out. So I. Um, you know, I mean, maybe there, there may be a place for that, right? But, you know, group volunteer, like, yeah, we're going to be painting. Please come help us paint if you know how to paint. Um, when we start, you know, tilling some earth for a garden, please come teach it. You know, I, I grew a bunch of flowers in Seattle, but I don't know how to grow food. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, right. So it's like, I don't know. I mean, if you know, if it, if, if, if the tools don't scare you, then you probably know how to use them, mm -hmm. right? So I, I welcome that. <laughs> mm -hmm. If I could say, go hang a couple doors, that would be really helpful to be quite yeah. honest, you know, and go to hang a couple doors and trim them out. 
and you just go, okay, what, what stock do you want me to use? And then I go, oh, it's, you know, like that would be awesome. Cool. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you, um, what you said about, uh, you know, when you're tilling the earth and like ready to plant and to come help with the gardening, that really um, made me have this vision of what I'm sure you see all the time of it as this vibrant block with a lot of inputs um, of that are a reflection of the people there and supporting and nourishing them in all these other ways yep. too. And that, is, that felt really cool to <laughs> imagine that. Yeah, it's a, yeah, thank you. It's a vision for real. Like I see it, you know, yeah. um, and I see it cool. with, with these participants and being able to really build something really beautiful, you know, be a part, again, yeah. something larger than yourself. It's, that could be really amazing. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. All right, so we have um, one more question. It's a lot of questions, and they, uh, Sunny actually says, oh, I have so many questions. So <laughs> some of them may be um, best answered through. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the final question, and what the best way for people to um, stay in, in the loop of what you're doing and um, you know, perhaps get involved is the best way to go to your website um, and reach out through there. Yeah, definitely. Our website, um, is, it, it has a ton of information, not only about what we're doing, but like the, the thoughts, to, a lot of statistics, um, <laughs> because I'm a reader, right? So, you know, it's like, you're gonna, that's, you know, you're gonna find a lot of articles and information. Um, so yeah, uh, we have a newsletter, um, my partner just helped me put a bunch of stuff in uh, email addresses in MailChimp. Nice. Thank Bravo. you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So now we're going to send out the newsletter very cool. soon. So you could sign up, um, send us an email, and we'll put you on that. Um, you know, we say they're quarterly. They are not because somebody would have to write those quarterly. <laughs> um, but we try to keep people updated. Um, we're doing a lot, yeah. right? And it would be great to keep people updated because um, it's some, it's very tangible, right? Like the progress, it's just so, yeah. So yeah, please, I mean, reach out, you know, if you're down this way, come, come through and, and check out where we're working. Awesome.